Time to move on to our first keynote speaker. Um, Adrian Smith, you will have his um, biography in the program. He is another person who, in his career, has crossed lots of boundaries. He's currently director and chief executive of the Alan Turing Institute, but he's also had high-profile roles in government, education, research funding, and the, <coughs> intriguingly, Atomic Energy Authority. The rest of all the other things that he's done you can read about. Adrian's going to talk to us about what the new frontiers of data science and AI may mean for social research. Adrian. Well, thank you for having me. The key word in the title is may. So these are my speculations and thoughts on what might be the implications of what many people see as a disruptive revolution, uh, big data, data science, AI. Now, I was hoping, yes, right. So what's new? We've always had data and clever people have mucked about with data and got insights and tried to make better decisions on the basis of data and written theses and so on. So what's new? What's new is somewhat a matter of scale just the sheer amount of data that's available. And by available, I mean data to which there is access, data you can get hold of. But getting hold of masses of data it wouldn't be much fun if you couldn't do anything with it. So what has gone hand in hand is a vast increase in computing power and the ability to store data. So far, so good. Lots of data. You can compute things. But what should you compute? What are the clever things? you might do with data. And so the other more is more insight through algorithms, and that's what takes us into the data science and AI. So in theory, then, these are fantastic opportunities to get greater insights into the world wherever there is more data that we can access and compute and find clever people to find ways of getting the insights from the data. But there are issues. Is there really access? There's a trite phrase rewriting modern capitalism, data is the new oil. Well, if data is the new oil, who owns the oil fields? Who owns the pipes? Who owns the tankers? So access to data, I think, is an interesting kind of social issue. Combined with that, access great, but on the other hand, do you want anybody to access your private data? So also there's issues of privacy. So access and privacy, in some sense, are trade-offs. Uh, and then, even if you didn't mind people mucking about with your data, you would like them not to show everybody else. So there are issues of security, uh, secrecy and defense and security. Uh, so here are big things that we need to sort out in terms of, of social discourse. Also, ethics. Suppose I were clever enough to be able to predict that a certain five-year-old was going to be a master criminal at the age of 16. What should I do with that? information or insight. So what, what we actually do and how we behave uh, in a social or political setting throws up all sorts of ethical issues. What are the rules of the game? Who decides them? And the who deciding then takes us into things like governance. Who owns the rule setting? Is, is it all right that Google owns your data and Facebook owns your data and does what it, it, it likes and nobody seems to mind? But if you try and link data in the health service, it would make us all better. Everybody screams privacy. So there are some interesting issues there. And more broadly, and I'm going to show you a scary slide next, um, in, in global geopolitical competitive terms, the ability to do clever things, in a sense, depends on greater access and less concern about the rules of the game, less concern about ethics. Uh, and if we're in a competition, those with less concern about ethics may become more prosperous than us because we've bound our hands and not able to exploit the clever things we might do. And so if you think about uh, China, um, and I'm, this is not to criticize China, I think probably if you were able to do a public opinion survey, a great many Chinese like having the state um, make them safe and know who the bad guys are and 
not let you play with your mobile unless we can identify who you are. Um, but that's a you know, geopolitical value debate. But virtually everything now in China is moving into the, the data, access to data, uh, playing with data space. Um, but you, there's another slide I haven't got today, which is a beggar in Beijing who's got a cash machine. Uh, you can't use cash in Beijing anymore. You get in the taxi, you've got to buy a taxi card. And then, of course, everybody knows where you got in the taxi, where you got out of the taxi, and so on and so forth. And you can either choose to regard that with horror or say, if, if only we had a system like that, the incident on London Bridge wouldn't have happened. And there's a huge biometric database and an AI plan for 2030, and a social credit score where for each individual, anything good you do, you get extra points. Anything bad you do, like dropping litter in the street, you get less points. And then when it comes to rationing things like cars or apartments or whatever, those with greater social credit score uh, get more of everything. Uh, the two guys there, those sinister spectacles, um, the police in, in, in a lot of Chinese cities have a mobile and they can point it at you and the facial recognition will tell you who you are and whether you're supposed to be there. Uh, nobody minds the surveillance, but people hated having the mobile phones pointed at them. And so they've developed these spectacles where you can see on the inside of the spectacles who it is. And everybody's happy now. Okay, I'm going to briefly say something about the Turing Institute because it's relevant to the points I'll make earlier. Um, the Alan Turing Institute is there to push the frontiers of what we can do with data science and artificial intelligence, but not in a totally abstract way just to write academic papers or prove mathematical theorems, but to make an impact on real-world problems, and I'll just say a few of those. If we're right that this stuff is a disruptor of all sorts of things, academic and, and everyday life, then there aren't enough people who get it, who are aware of the implications at one end of the scale and can do the coding and the analysis at the other end of the scale. And there is a huge feeling in government, not just uh, national government, local government at the moment, that we all really could revolutionize what we do in terms of development of policy, implementation of policy, monitoring of policy, if only we use data uh, more cleverly. So uh, just a few of the challenges we set ourselves in, in Turing, and it's relevant to the discussion today. So let's revolutionize the NHS, okay? So the point I want to make with all these things, and let's, in engineering, bridges, roads, sensors are being built into everything. So air quality, there are sensors, defense and security. The economy happens second by second, not every month when... Um, the National Statistician publishes a table of GDP figures, it's going on instantly. So couldn't we get more insight into what's happening in the economy if we exploited uh, bank transition, transaction data or credit card transaction data? Now, in each of these things, I'm parading it slightly, data science, AI sounds techie, but actually all these things fundamentally involve social processes, behavioral processes, ethical and governance processes. So one of the, th the messages today actually is that all this stuff that this revolution, if you like, in, in data and AI enables one to do creates opportunities and demands on social research as much as it does on techie research. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but the, the clever things you do with data may require you to design computers in different ways, so we're in that space. But one of the biggies that I want to stress to you is making algorithmic systems fair, ethical, and transparent. If you know some of the ways in which machine learning works, you train up algorithms on, on data. Good. And it can do cleverer things than you could with the data. But who chose the data in the first place? Are there structures in the data which are inherently biased in some sense or unfair to particular groups? How do we know those kind of things? So every time we have the opportunity for one of these fantastic scientific techie advantages. It throws up an enormous number of social research opportunities. Uh, even research itself, and if I have time at the end, I'll briefly tell you about a project uh, which we call Living with Machines, which is trying to understand the social and economic implications of the first industrial revolution, 
because it might give us insights into the current one, which is the fourth industrial revolution. And th so the research you do in social sciences and the humanities, if we can digitize, for example, archives, and we've got a digitization of all the archives referring to the first industrial revolution, it changes the nature of research questions and social questions that you can ask. And of course, government is very interested in how we can use this to improve processes of government. I'm not gonna give a mathematical lecture on, on the magic of machine learning, uh, but you will know since about 2010, we can train algorithmic systems to, to recognize uh, you know, visual images and, and sound uh, better than humans can when, when you give them an explicit task, like is this a giraffe or a horse? Um, but it, at heart, the, 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 the possibilities of, of these things are fantastic, but if you think of fitting a straight line to data, and I guess we all know what that means, you, you could just wobble a line around until it fits the data you've seen the best it can. And that's wobbling two things, right? The slope and the intercept of the line. Imagine you had 10 million things you could wobble around to train a machine on billions of bits of data to find things much more subtle than a straight line. Like I, I said giraffe, and it's a zebra. I see, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> uh, so here's almost the most important thing. If we take various projects that we do, so we can train uh, machine learning to detect anomalies, let's say in bank transactions or, or whatever. So we have novel ways of absolutely detecting financial crime. When people get uh, credit card applications uh, refused, it'll be based on some variables that somebody said, you know, they were in prison or they got behind with the rent or whatever, whatever, whatever. Can one kind of understand those kind of systems and correct them for, for biases? And on the privacy front, if you're gonna make people link your data and, and, and manipulate it to get greater insights, you, you just want somehow it to be protected. So techie things like homomorphic encryption, which is being able to encrypt the data, but then play with it and link it in various forms. All these things um, require us to pay a lot of attention to the safe and ethical social surround in which this takes place. So I've just listed some of the things some of the topics that come up in this space, which are not the topics of the mathematicians, but the topics of the social scientists, the behavioral scientists, the economists, and the professors of ethics. Privacy, obvious what that means in a certain sense, control. Who, who, who's in control of selecting the data that goes into these machines? Making it secure. Fairness, um, if, you t if you were to take, let's say, headhunters, who wanted to automate the process of sifting through CVs and which ones to throw in the bin and all the rest of it, you could design a computer program to mimic what, what they do. You just take the processes of the firm and you embed it in an algorithm. But if the firm exhibits gender unfairness or age unfairness or whatever form of unfairness, that will be embedded in the new algorithm because what you've done is mimic the processes that existed before. So how do we check that the processes we set up are fair. When we develop an algorithm on one particular case, we then start using it in other places. How do we know it's exportable? How do we know we haven't tuned it to one particular thing and it will go wrong elsewhere? Many of the issues that arise with fitting statistical models, for example. And then you take the claims of deep mind that can play chess and go much better than human beings, okay? But then they glory in the fact they don't really understand what the algorithm did because it doesn't look like the things that humans do. So fantastic, goes beyond human and you don't know what it did, you can't explain it. However, if you're gonna use that kind of stuff to tell a surgeon what to do in an operation, it's unlikely you say, well, you know, the machine just told me to cut over there, I don't know why. Uh, so explicability and transparency might be all right for chess non-explicability and non-transparency might be all right for machines playing chess, but it's not all right for most of the interactions of algorithms uh, with, with humans. So there's a huge agenda within Turing of bringing together social, behavioral, ethical things in all we do, in every particular case. And then it feeds back on itself, because if you suspect that a data set might be biased in some sense, or have problems with it, 
Can you use techie ways of finding out? If you had a scatter plot of data and you were fitting a straight line, and I had a billion points here and one over there, I guess we all know the line will go through that one point. So one point will distort the message of a billion points. How do you see that when you've got trillions of data points and you can't visualize it? And so some of the stuff we do is how can you see inside what algorithms are doing? So you're, you're using machine learning on machine learning to give you insights. So from a Turing point of view, again, the message really, we have enormous convening power. We can bring together large numbers of people from lots of different disciplines to collaborate. And I think one of my big messages is that this, this revolution, as it were, which looks like a techie revolution, should be a big driver for much more kind of interdisciplinary joint working. Okay. Out there, there's the great unwashed public, including me. We could end up with Daily Mail front lines which say, you know, algorithm kills 200 old age pensioners in Oldham. Or mad robot runs a moke on the A1 and whatever, whatever. And this is not, not daft because we all presumably have memories of GM crops and MMR where, where really important scientific insights and knowledge in the case of genetically modified crops, what it could do in the third world. Literally, we're talking maybe millions of people who would have been better off had we not gone down that route. And now we're in grave danger of anti-vaccination uh, rhetoric uh, creating situations where we may have measles epidemics. So, uh, epidemic. so how, to, how to promulgate awareness and understanding of the kind of good and important things we can do with this stuff whilst avoiding uh, the horror front page of the Daily Mail. So I think here's a challenge for all of us. How do you promulgate that public debate? And actually, that sets in train then new research agendas. How, how do you broker? The, um, the Royal Society of Arts recently produced a document which is d democratizing debate about technology. How do you do it? Citizen juries, whatever, whatever. So there's an important extra issue here. This is not just a techie conversation. And in the public debate, what should be the agency? Um, you know, if, if the government stands up and says this is good, that might not be the cleverest way of convincing people that it's good. So what could be the social agencies for promulgating uh, the good stuff and warning people about the bad stuff? So there's the Royal Society of Arts. Uh, it's a document democratizing decisions about technology, which I think sets an interesting social research agenda. I'm now going to talk about one of the particular um, Turing programs. Um, I, I could talk about lots of other things, but I, I know this one inside out because it's Turing. Uh, Professor Helen Margots, uh, who used to run the Internet Institute in Oxford, um, heads up what we call our public policy program. So this is really taking um, issues of public policy, a lot of them government departmental, but they could be uh, other agencies, and thinking through uh, what can be done with data science and AI and how you broker uh, the conversations and the joint working. So just take some of the things, I mean, I've said making government better, but I'll, it's actually making society better. Um, education and understanding uh, education at a child-centric level, same with healthcare. Um, can, policies that um, make the life safer on the roads, crime reduction, uh, financial crisis, interventions, children at risk. I mean, just, just a scattergun of all the things where people form policy, they implement policy, and we all want the world to be better in probably the same sense. How do we, you know, being rather pretentious, make government more efficient, fair, responsive, uh, and, and etc. So, uh, just to say, a lot of this is driven obviously through policy that emanates in government, in government departments, research commissioned by government. Uh, so, just a little snapshot over the last uh, four years of government announcements that mention data science or artificial intelligence. And you see, it's an absolute kind of explosion. So another of the messages is that for better or for worse, this, these are not just sort of buzzwords anymore, uh, in 
policy makers and decision makers at the highest level, there is more and more focus on data science and AI as, as an enabler uh, for social benefit. So that's great. But then you have a look and see, well, is there anybody in government who understands any of this stuff? Uh, just take a simple way of looking at it. Uh, employees in each department that have some sort of knowledge or title of data scientist. And um, I won't comment further. Government is very siloed. This has relevance to social research agendas. Uh, if within a, a particular department like, like Bayes, one end of the department, you've got people interested in startups and productivity, uh, and then you've got interest in fuel poverty, another end of the department, and things happen within departments, whereas life happens across departments. So one of the big things we're trying to promulgate through Turing and working with the government chief scientific advisors and others, uh, and I'll come back to um, uh, the Office for National Statistics in a moment, um, is, is linking information and insights across government departments who in many cases are the owners of the crucial data. So things, if you're looking at fuel poverty, you really might be looking at, at DWP, housing and local government, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a big issue, not just in approaching problems of bringing together interdisciplinary, it's when you go back to the data you want, the data is often in a lot of different kind of locations, and there's an issue in and around that. However, um, I don't think I have a slide on it. The Digital Economy Act actually gave the Office for National Statistics, Jill's old stamping ground, the authority to access and link all government data sets. Not as easy as it sounds because there are methodological issues about linkage and privacy and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is a potential there that wasn't there some years ago. Uh, so in our public policy program, Turing itself invests about a million a year um, to link up our community of researchers uh, to, to give them awareness of the kind of social policy issues that are being thrown at us uh, from different uh, sources. So uh, we're working with 13 government departments, eight non-ministerial departments, including the regulators, who have potentially important roles here, and lots of other agencies, local authorities, police forces, etc. So we're working with 70 public sector organizations to try and understand how this data science and AI stuff, uh, combined with serious social science, behavioral science, economics, etc., can potentially transform the landscape. All this is very abstract. <coughs> so what some of us thought, let's stop just talking about it abstractly, but take an, an area of life which is complicated and I think most people think is a bit of a shambles. Let's call it the criminal justice system. So you do something wrong, you come in contact with the police, you come in contact with the courts, you come in contact with the prisons, you come in contact with the parole service, and then of course half, half of you go around again. So this is kind of madness in some sense, but there's huge amount of data about those kind of journeys. So if you take criminal justice in the Home Office, we have pitched to say, give us the resources to actually attach this at scale as a case study of whether you can transform insights from, from social and statistical and other research. Uh, but the, 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 another key message here is if you're going to do this stuff to impact on the criminal justice system, the health system, this is big bucks. This isn't a 100,000 project. So this is 8 million quid to try and do this. So in the criminal justice and home office context, um, you know, it's a, some of it is a bit like anomaly detection in finance, detecting what's going on, maybe predicting and forecasting. Can, can in, in a sense, what parole boards and release schemes in prisons are doing, even though they don't do it actually, is probabilistic prediction. You know, what are the chances if we do this, if we do this, if we let this person go? very timely kind of stuff at the moment. If you then make a model of processes, 
so you know the kind of journey process. You can then do computer simulations to see what if we did it differently, then what if we change this parameter, what if we change that parameter. And you can try and optimize and evaluate the way that systems work. Uh, you can see what um, you can do with personal characteristics in all this and surround it by ethics and governance. So we have one almighty experiment underway, which is can we model uh, the criminal justice system and get insights and, and simulate and do things to find a better way of designing and working the system. So ask me in three years' time whether we did it. But this is, as I say, uh, a possible paradigm shift that really serious research into the fundamentals, a justice system, a health system, whatever, it's a bit like what scientists have known for a long time. You, you can't do it in little bitty kind of bits of research. You actually have to have big teams and you have to have big investment and you have to have time scales that enable you to do it. So this is five years worth, uh, 10 research projects. Um, you know, we've got about 40 academics working full time in this space. So there's a, there's a point to make there. Um, just then listing some of the things um, that are, are kind of sexy in a way from a, a sort of policy thing. Online hate speech or online harms, major social issue. And online harms come in many forms. They, they can be uh, individualized hate speech. They can be racial. Uh, they can be anti-vaccination campaigns. All these are, are what I would call online harms. And so can you develop systems for monitoring and intervening in online harms is, is another major thing. Modern slavery, I don't know how widespread the use of the word is, um, but um, if I said it, modern slavery um, involves maybe 40 million people around the world, would that make it an interesting problem? I'll just tell you one specific that we're working on. There are about 150,000 people who spend their whole lives as, as slaves on ships in international waters fishing. They never set foot on land. The boats come and take the fish from them and all they do is sit on the boats and fish in areas of, of in international waters. One of our projects is using um, satellite and other methods to, to identify and um, deal with that. Um, Scores, scores are used increasingly in things like probation risk. In the United States, there are actually commercial apps which are being sold to judges to tell them what sentence would be appropriate given the characteristics of the individual. This is real stuff. And so uh, getting into understanding the potential biases and, and use of this is, is hugely important. Anyway, it's, it's really to say there's a fantastic array of really important social problems that we're attempting to creep up on. And the stuff in criminal justice, if you look down the left-hand side, we could actually do similar things in, in, in everything, really. Health, uh, environment, transport, energy, and we have conversations going on in a lot of those spaces. The key thing here is those teams of like 40 researchers, probably half techie, half social, behavioral, economic, and the rest. And so I think that, that kind of Big team building, big ambition, proper resources, proper time scale is something that may be disrupting the research landscape. And there's a lot of interest in, in, in government at doing these things at scale. And I thought I'd just give you a, another little exemplar, exemplar of um, the way that the potential of more data, one way that more data can come in the research domain is through digitization. So Living with Machines is not a very informative title. What it is actually is an, in, an investigation which says, suppose we had available the digitization of all the archives relating to the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution. And all the, and could you tease out of that all the kind of social and economic ramifications as they rolled through the system, how, you know, the public perception, how decision-making took place within all that. So there's a whole host of research questions in social science humanities 
where the digitization of archival resources makes the world a different place for doing research. Okay? So this happens to be the first industrial uh, revolution. Uh, so we're trying to understand the 19th century by using 21st century technology. It's pretentious, kind of. Anyway, that's, that's how you sell it. Um, <laughs> But we are debating right at this moment if data, the advent of data science and AI, big data, is the fourth industrial revolution, transforming, I mean, we've already seen transformation of economies by online, right? Uh, but if we now have corporate lawyers, for example, may be redundant, because what corporate lawyers do is really plow through documents looking at clauses and seeing whether they match up with other clauses and so on and so forth. Digitize it, five lines of code, it's over. <laughs> pathology in medicine. What do pathologists do? They stare at slides, images, to see if they can spot what's going on, what the anomalies are, and so on and so forth. It's a terrible thing to say, but actually, algorithms can do that better. So maybe pathologists are over. Radiologists, they look at x-ray patterns of anything where there are visual images and experts, consultants. What's a, what's a medical consultant as opposed to a junior doctor? I'm talking diagnosis. I'm not talking about care. All right? In diagnostic terms, what's a consultant? A consultant is simply somebody who's seen more cases than the junior doctor and remembered the correlations better. I can write algorithms to do that better in any field of medicine. Okay? You're supposed to gasp at that. <laughs> <laughs> but if true, if true, then pathology, radiology, corporate lawyers, the profound implications on the workforce. Okay? Can we understand that? Well, one way of trying to understand how these things ripple through is to go back to the first industrial revolution and study all those same questions in that context. And that's what living with machine does. What was the effect of labor mechanization? Um, we are uh, privileged and we have access to the complete historical archive of all the newspapers which are held in the British Library and, and many other uh, documents. And this, again, is a pioneering experiment because I, I'll show you some stuff in a minute that I don't expect you to absorb in a way. I don't understand most of it myself. Um, you're going to digitize stuff, but digitizing a load of words just gives you a load of digitized words. I mean, how, how do you then construct that into, into patterns or symbols or something that you can do computational or searches or correlations or, or whatever? So this is getting into novel territory. It's when you've got text and you digitize it and you transform it, what are the models and the tools and the codes that enable you to play games in this space? And that is then forging the way to something which I might suggest at the end might have to become part of the skill set of social scientists and social researchers. We'll see. So this is radical. We're bringing together a number of disciplines ranging from historians to research software engineers uh, to, to try and forge a common way of defining problems so that the modern technology can answer the social and human questions, which I think is quite an interesting thing. So just briefly blind you with science. Uh, going back to what I said earlier, in terms of whenever you have a data set, you can say, is it biased? Is it selective? You know, who, cho who chose it? You know, what, what does it mean? So if you take, <coughs> you don't have the complete digitized press of everything in the 19th century because it's stuff that survived and is held somewhere in an archive where you can get hold of it and digitize it. So by the time you've gone through that process, you've already had some implicit uh, selection effects. So can you understand what you've done? So here's, here's the clever stuff. You code this stuff up in various ways. Anybody know what that, that is? That's the Preston Herald from 1855. 
the parts of it in digitized form. What you can do with it then is, is, is if you've digitized these things, you can say of a document, uh, what, what's the political kind of complexion of where it came from? What area was it read in? What, did, what was the price of it? And that would lead to a selection effect of how the public received information and so on and so forth. So then you can try and see if there are underrepresented bits of the population who weren't getting access to X, Y, Z and so on. So then we get rather deeply into the, the, the data, but let's pick this slide because there's a wonderful quote from Karl Marx. There's an assumption that human affairs are dictated by technology and machines that many in this room might want to question. But is it true? So Marx would have said the hand mill gave you society with the feudal lord, the steam mill society with the industrial capitalist. So if, if that's a techie driver, what's the modern equivalent? The ownership of data and AI, boss of Google? So, the theory that's driving this social rec research is this machines drive history. Can you examine that problem? And that's the kind of ambitious thing that we're trying to do. So there, there are lots of techie things. I'm going to stop almost now. A lot of techie things here, but it's, it's forging new research tools, and it requires um, various kind of things. So here are some, what I would say, some of the implications of all this stuff. In recent years, uh, educating uh, people in social sciences, British Academy and others uh, uh, had something called QSTEP, which crudely is about making sure that social science researchers have appropriate quantitative skills. Just as you've caught up with that, I think the new challenge then is can we make sure that we all have the right awarenesses and knowledge of what data science and AI is, can be, offers, dangers, uh, so I think there's a major awareness education issue here for all of us. The other thing is that if you take something like, uh, let's take all the data in the health service and revolutionize healthcare, there's a danger you might think that's simply to do with, you know, diagnosing things better or whatever. But of course, the national health system is a system involving huge amounts of... Um, human interventions combined with techie insights and all the rest of it. So understanding the big challenges, whether it's health, defense, security, and all the rest of it, um, there needs to be a huge connectivity between the social research communities and the techie communities on a scale I don't think we've probably ever thought of. How do we manufacture that? And it may be that everybody needs to understand in order for data to do stuff for you, somebody has to kind of get an algorithm coded up and make it available to you to use. And so I think there's a lack of appreciation of what we call research software engineering, which is the skill set that takes you from, you know, let's suppose it were a statistical model or something, right the way through to being able to employ that at the level of the, of the researcher. And the other thing, the good news in one sense, is there is absolutely hugely increased government interest in policy questions and funding attacks on policy questions and interventions at scale that we all may be able to exploit, but we'll all wake up on Friday morning and know whether that's true or not. <laughs> that's me done. Okay, that was absolutely fantastic, Adrian. Thank you so much for uh, that breadth um, um, and insights. Uh, I've got loads of questions, and I've already got two that people have sent in. If anybody else wants to ask a question, either then please send it in or um, put your hand up and the mic will come to you. Um, I'm going to start with one of mine which is to pick up on um, your slide which, uh, which you talked about public debate. Um, and I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that um, because there's a lot about collaboration. You talk about techies and the wider research community. But what is the space for the public? What do they actually think about all of this stuff? 
Um, what's the level of understanding and how much does that matter? And how much is that going to be either an enabler or a constraint? I think of it particularly in the context of one of your examples, which was uh, public policy, social policy, 70 public sector organisations. What about the private sector in all of this? Okay, so um, these are not problems to which I know the solution in a glib way. What some of us are trying to do is, is kind of stimulate thinking about this. Now, there's another kid on the block called the AI Council, which was recently formed to signal to government what are the really big issues that government needs to think about strategically and, and to invest to make sure we don't get it wrong. And basically, there are three headings. One is data. Um, the ownership of data, uh, you know, think, think Facebook, think government data, think of what you could, you know, all the great things you could do, but all the dangers. How do you broker a conversation and a governance in and around data? And that's both public and private sector. The second one is skills. That, and skills under really two headings. One is the potential disruption of workforce, which could have tremendous implications for inequality. Uh, if you think of the kind of jobs that this will create and the jobs it will destroy, what does that mean for inequality? And also the fact that actually where you can do good with this stuff, we need an army of people who know how to do it. So there's all sorts of dimensions to a skills agenda. Okay, coming to your point, the third heading that's been identified by the AI Council is narrative. What is the narrative or narratives. You know, the narrative around data might be somewhat different from the narrative around algorithms, might be different from the narrative around robots, taxonomy, and who should be the narrators? And what should be the agency of narration? And to be honest, still, I think this is open stuff. Mm. I think. So is the risk that the tech is going faster than that narrative and that discourse? I, I think the. The techie, the techie stuff throws this up as something that has to be brokered. And I say the, the Royal Society of Art thing on democratizing debate about technology is, is, is a generic kind of question in this space. Um, you know, do, do you do citizen focus groups, juries, the role of the media, um, you know, who owns the narrative? Okay. I, think it's, I think it's a fantastic... And I, I just don't think it has a high enough profile as an issue. Okay. Thank you. Let me turn to um, loads of questions that we've got now. One of the more popular ones is, how important is it for social researchers to understand how AI works? Or should we accept hyper-specialization and working in cross-cutting teams? There's a link to that, which is about, and where's the training? Yeah. Or, so forget, forget AI and stuff for a moment. And suppose that question had just been posed in terms of statistics or statistical methods, okay? So the answer would be absolutely essential to understand what kinds of statistical methods can do what for you. Doesn't mean to say you have to be an expert at left-handed logistic regression. It means there's, there's a toolkit there and understanding what the toolkit can do for you. So I do think an awareness of um, you know, machine learning, AI, various things, uh, what, it, what it can do, how it basically works, is very different from understanding the internal mechanics of a deep neural net. So I think it's the same analogy with statistics. And now I've forgotten what the second part of the question is. Well, training, availability of OK, training. yeah. So um, it depends at, w at what level do you start, right? So let's, let's say what, what we've done so far. So, at the higher level, techie level as it were, vast increase in the number of PhDs funded in this space. New kids on the block, master's courses. One, the, these things are being driven and funded out of DCMS. One is industrial masters. So these are masters geared to producing people who are oven ready to quote uh, something like that. I don't know where I heard that one. Um, oven ready for business and industry. And the other one, which is just about to be launched and is probably of most interest, conversion masters. 
And these could be a variety of, it could be uh, conversion masters for lawyers or historians or whatever, which would be at the less techie level. But a lot of people in, in, in the legal profession are going to have to understand as part of being a lawyer what this, this stuff can do in, in you know, legal discourse and documentation and the rest. The other thing, I do a lot of evening gigs at dinners in return, in return for getting drunk. I do, <laughs> I do semi-comedy acts for various real, real fun guys like the Institute of Actuaries <laughs> and the Risk Management uh, Institute. Um, because if you think about it, an, a, a profession like an actuary, there's a syllabus and a training that makes you, you've got to know this if you're going to be an actuary. And of course, now these poor guys have got to know a lot about this. Because the manipulation of big data, the ability uh, to do kind of big projections in terms of age profiles going forward, both for pensions and for the NHS, and the risk manager guys, um, the stuff let loose in financial um, institutions and financial apps um, is a nightmare of how do, you, how do you regulate it, and the regulators as well. So um, there is a vast need for education at all sorts of levels. And that we got down now to conversion masters, which broadens it. I think one of the big challenges, what on earth do you do in schools? What should kids know about this stuff? And, you know, reforming the curriculum is a mugs game because there's already too much goes on and teachers can't keep up with it anyway. Uh, so, lots to do after Friday. Let's hope there's um, a world in which to do it. <laughs> Let me, I, I know that, that we just be finished, but there's loads of questions, Adrian, that you've prompted, and there's one that um, I think touches on something slightly different. The role for qualitative researchers in, the, in this age that you're describing. Well, it depends what you mean by qualitative, doesn't it? But all the kind of issues around biases and fairnesses and ethics and, and all the rest of it are not in themselves techie numbers things. It's, I think anybody who wants to define themselves as basically a qualitative, you're asking what are the, the, the qualitative, the conceptual, the, the more general social qualitative implications of this stuff? And I, it's, there's just a shed load of interesting things come out of it. Um, just take, just take a quasi-legal qualitative social science question. Can you regulate algorithms? Yeah. Yeah, that was going to be one of my others. What's the role for government in this? Um, Even so, after Friday. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's one absolute clear one. It, it is in the realm of regulation. If you think of the arguments of why anybody invests in the UK or is here at all, you know, you roll out sort of, we're not bad at the rule of law, we have safe, safer than anybody else financial regulations, intellectual property is better protected in this country than elsewhere. So if we could set ourselves up as the most safe and ethical place to do artificial intelligence, there's both an economic and a, and a social plus in that. So I think uh, the, role of, the role of regulation um, in cutting through this, this landscape, and it's regulation of different things. Regulation of data is very different from regulation of algorithms. Mm. Okay. Last one from here. Um, that there are loads that we haven't been able to get through, but there's a, a, a different theme, which is that, that all your examples are national. They're about national government, um, national collaborations. What about local government? What about smaller area collaborations? Well, if you gave me another hour, <laughs> I can tell you about, for example, our summer school on data science for social good, which is explicitly for charities, NGOs, local government. Uh, and we had um, Ofsted on monitoring of foster homes, uh, charities for the homeless, how do you count and measure the homeless and interventions on the homeless and so on. So, tons of it. It's just you only gave me ten minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I, and presumably the Turing website 
we'll have more about summer schools and those kinds yeah. of collaborations. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we have to thank Adrian. I'm sure that those questions we haven't been get, able to get round to, you will continue to talk about over coffee. I certainly will. Um, and there may well be some themes that we come back to with other talks later in the day. So, Adrian, thank you very much. That was. Thank you.